In particular, I want to introduce David Fox. David uh, is an entre entrepreneurial business development professional with extensive experience in technology managed services. Over 20 years of experience with a broad background in wireless communications, strategic partnership development, carrier relations, real estate contracts, finance, engineering, design and operations. A diverse customer and partner experience includes real estate contacts with Fortune 500 companies, public education systems, for-profit and non-for-profit healthcare systems, major class A office building owners in the Chicago and New York City markets, and other top real estate developers. Please welcome David Fox. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you all very much. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to come speak uh, in front of you. Um, it's good going last, because you get to hear a lot of uh, comments and some of the questions, and um, I, I wish Jeff was here. Uh, Jeff and I have uh, uh, done uh, deals together, um, or he represented a property. I represented, obviously, American Tower, and I wanted to tell him, you know, he was talking about lead times, and I wanted to tell him the longest lead time was negotiating the contract. Yeah. So, but uh, I'll get him uh, on the side note. I don't see him back there. Um, the agenda today is to talk about a little bit about industry trends, about American Tower, and then about rooftop partnerships. Um, I can also take questions on engineering, um, on distributed antenna systems, and third-party funding models, and how they're changing based on the current environment of, uh, of the carrier's capital spend. So please uh, feel free to interject anytime and ask any type of questions. Um, it's a little... My history lesson slide of where we've been going um, and where we're at today. Um, back in 2000, when we started to deploy networks, the carriers were out building 400 foot or higher cell phone towers. And we call that high and wide. That's how you first deploy a network. High to cover a wide area because you don't have a subscriber base underneath that. It's like an umbrella. How many people can you fit under your umbrella and how big, and, and protect them from the rain depending on um, how tall it is? And then once, once more people start coming under your antenna and, or under your umbrella and, and needing coverage from the rain, they, they don't want to get rained on, you don't have room. So you don't have any more capacity on those 400 foot towers. So what do you do? Well, you got to lower them and you got to have some other people grab some umbrellas, right? So we're all covered. So, you know, 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003 was high and wide and cover the freeways. Then uh, Palm came out, uh, Blackberry started coming out, subscribers increased, and it was, okay, so what do we do now? We gotta go for some lower um, cell towers. Uh, and, and, and build more of them, and that moved into um, a mobile data. What, what was driving all of that was, was the first mobile data. HTC came out 2008. Apple started coming out with, with their smartphones. Um, so uh, coverage needed to increase, and density needed to increase. Um, and then we all know today we're looking at in-building systems. We're dropping the RAD Center even further on in-building and outdoor outdoor distributed antenna systems. So we didn't really hit that a lot today. We talked a lot about indoor, but there's also outdoor distributed antenna systems. And in a campus environment, if you're class A and you have multiple buildings, um, you're gonna wanna have uh, you're gonna wanna have your own coverage on campus also. Outside while people are out um, having lunch and, and engaging um, after work. So a little bit about American Tower and how we fit into that. Um, we're an S&P 500 company. We're the second largest REIT now in the United States. We do over 2.2 billion in revenue. Um, we own a lot of assets. In the United States, um, it's 40,000, uh, getting close to 50,000 wireless broadcast towers, 15,000 rooftop rights, and over 350 distributed antenna systems. We did over 22,000 transactions with the carriers last year on existing assets and new assets. 
So the carriers are working today to upgrade, upgrade our managed rooftops, our managed DAS systems, our managed towers to LTE. So we touch those systems and we're engaged with them on a daily basis um, to make those changes. Our customers that we work with, obviously, are the wireless carriers. Uh, we also are the only major tower company that has a dedicated broadcast division. And Jeff is here that represents, uh, who's a, a main part of our broadcast division with NBC Universal, other radio stations. There's major buildings in the city that we manage um, that bring in significant revenue uh, for what we call our boomer sites, which are very high. Um, high sites that can cover a, a, a large geographic area. And you still do that on broadcasters because it's downlink only there. You don't have a lot of users coming back up, taking capacity, that's a broadcast coming down. Uh, we also have um, a financial services segment where we generate revenues for our partners by using high frequency trading microwave links from Chicago, uh, the mercantile to, to Wall Street. So there are dedicated microwave paths on our towers and on rooftops um, because latency is the most important thing right now for the trading. Um, and believe it or not, the way the, the crow flies by microwave is faster than the ground route to fiber. And you can get there maybe eight microseconds faster. Well eight microseconds when you're trading uh, large amounts of, of stock can make a significant difference. Uh, we have governmental um, customers, public safety, uh, transportation. We currently own the rights to over 2,600 uh, miles of railroad right-of-way. We do utilities, oil and gas. Uh, we also have a large wireless internet service providers. What are those? We call them WISPs. They're the small internet service providers that provide um, um, wa mobile wireless, just broadband connection for your computer um, in, in rural markets right now. Some of our real estate partners um, include ISC from uh, um, NASCAR. Uh, we represent Simon Property Group. We represent all the major mall REITs, Westfield, GGP. We have ag agreements with Highwoods. Um, we, uh, one of the marquee names we have here in, in the city is the Javits Center. So we deployed an in-building distributed antenna system there. Um, we also have one at the Marriott Marquis and some other buildings um, in the city. So what can you do with your property and, and generate revenue from it? Um, if you have raw land, which is probably not, not here in the city, but if you're in the tri-state area, uh, you can uh, generate revenue by deploying towers. Uh, and usually how that business model works is uh, American Tower will give you a flat rent uh, for a certain square footage um, on your raw land. Um, and we put the investment in for the tower and we generate, uh, we go out and sell that space to the tower. So we will invest all the capital in, into building that structure itself to support. Um, on your rooftops, today, the rooftop and network design, the first stop for machine to machine networks, for, for large public safety networks that are being rolled out, um, for new competitors coming into the marketplace. Um, I don't know if anyone remembers Clearwire when they were out for a while, when T-Mobile, or sorry, when um, Metro PCS and Cricket, when those smaller players come out, they go to and try to find a person that has a large amount of assets on the books so they can get a one contract and have access to thousands of properties. So they come to us and we give them a list of our sites they import that into their mapping tools and select lo those locations. So that's how your one of the major ways your, your properties can be chosen if you have an agreement with someone like American Tower, a third-party neutral host. Another way that we grow that portfolio of rooftop sites is under the current networks. The way the carriers 
design around current capacity issues is they take traffic data that's collected that they can dump out of the switch and they put it into a program called MapInfo. It's universally used around the industry and they lay down all these coverage issues by color and they can tell where their issues are. And then they take the list of sites that are managed by someone like American Tower and then they lay those sites down onto that coverage map and can then identify if your rooftop or your building is going to fit into their network designs and solve that problem. It does take some time though when you do look at your assets, no matter what asset, if it's an in-building DAS, if it's a tower, if it's a rooftop, it does take time. So you need to get started no matter who you choose to go with, if you're looking to, to, to generate revenue from your property, you need to get started. And just make sure when you're negotiating that contract that if that person isn't performing for you, that you have an out, but get started. So some of these slides here is, is how wireless can make building more attractive for you. In building wireless infrastructure can deliver a wide range of benefits to the owner beyond keeping tenants happy. This is included on a rooftop site as well as an in-building DAS site. Um, again, if you do have a smaller building outside of the city that isn't reaching LEED certification, if you do put a cell site or open yourself up to putting a cell site installation on the rooftop, um, you can get in-building coverage and not have to invest into a distributed antenna system. Because if it's under a certain amount of square footage, you're not gonna get interest from the carriers. Um, that's something that you will either have to do yourself or, or look to put in a rooftop. On the rooftop installation, how the uh, overall agreement works is that we sign a marketing agreement with the property owner initially. At the same time, we do negotiate a site lease we do this because we do want to speed up the process, although, although it does take some time. Uh, it does, it does take, take a while, and we don't want to encumber your property with a lease if we don't have revenue to give you, and you want to be able to get out of that. So within the marketing agreement itself that we negotiate is usually for 36 months to go get a carrier. You, you know, that sounds like a long time, but you got to remember, let's say you and I signed an agreement today. I'm not going to be able to get that asset into the carrier's hands for them to evaluate for co-location until next September. So the, whoever you go with, you need to know that the budgeting cycles of the carriers when they do their planning is from August to about November every year. So once that budget is completed by November, 2016 capital budgets have been set and they're going with that. Now there's always, we all know there's always money to move around by the end of the year. Uh, and if it's an important enough building, or if it's, a, if it's an important enough location, um, they'll find money to do that, or they'll, or they'll, they'll wanna solve that problem and do that. But you've gotta know that you know, th there's a significant time before they would even consider your project for, for the build itself. Simplicity of the documents that you end up signing is the key to maximum revenue. When an asset goes before a carrier, they have an administrator, um, someone that's probably, you know, uh, is not a lawyer, is not in the RF engineering department. Um, they're probably not even that high up in the deployment. And they have a checklist. They have a checklist, has like 15 points of it. And if they call ATC and they say, we're interested in this prop, uh, this property, send us over, before we spend money, send us over a copy of your agreement with the building owner so we can review it to make sure that it meets our needs and it protects us if, I'm gonna, if, we, if, if the carrier is going to invest that money. Um, so we send that over to them and if it's more than 15 pages, I mean you, you probably won't even get that person to look at it. And then the next one is going to be another checkbox. And the next one's gonna be another check. You have another, you have another boxes, enough boxes that are checked just by that lower administrative person. They're gonna say, let's go to candidate B. Whenever they're going out and release that search ring, candidate A, candidate B, candidate C. 
So they, they will move on. So um, I've negotiated with Jeff, and he does a very good job uh, protecting and informing building owners. Um, and we appreciate that because a building owner that is not informed um, and then finds out later something that, that, that uh, they don't really like, then they're not going to be a, a happy and willing partner. And we, we don't want that. Because if the building owner's not making money, American Tower's not making money. And I think that's all what we really want to do. So carriers avoid sites that have complex processes and legal documents that are lengthy and complicated. And that's the benefit of going with someone like American Tower or someone that has um, constant established relationships and pre-approved con contracts that are already done with the carriers. Uh, we try to, when we tr go out to negotiate the agreement with the building owner, we work to represent you. Uh, you'll, you'll hear that uh, we call ourselves frenemies. American Tower is a frenemy of the carrier because we're, 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 we are good friends. We do a lot of business. Uh, they created the third-party industry by selling their assets. But we also want to drive maximum revenue because that's what our shareholders demand, and that's what you want. So we walk that line um, and push as hard as we can to get terms on that contract that's going to make people want to come to your building. Because we can sit and pay lawyers $10,000 a piece while we negotiate this agreement, and I could tell you when I get that signature that if someone's, I could say no one is ever going on this because the terms are so bad uh, that the carrier is just going to say, ah, it's more worth it for me to go look at another solution. And a point in cases in New York City where you're going to see the carriers choose to go on assets in the right of way. They're going to choose to go on street lights, street furniture that's in place um, in the city. They're going to go aerial on aerial infrastructure, uh, power lines in the comm space, because it's although it's a bigger pain in the butt up front to get an agreement and a franchise agreement with the city, it, at least it can be guaranteed uh, versus what type of arrangements are agreed with property owners and lower rooftops. And that's, you know, something to be uh, definitely aware of. So we've developed short, simple, plain language lease templates because the people that are actually reviewing the document are not lawyers. The leases contain industry standard terms that are important to wireless carriers. You know, it's going to be a 25-year agreement if you want a rooftop. That's not something that's negotiable. It's five years with five automatics. Um, the carriers are going to be investing significant capital, and if that's not something with you're comfortable with, they'll find somebody that will. Again, we talked about using standard lease forms. Again, we talked about carriers uh, review. They have the checklist. And they routinely abandon sites where the lease is lengthy, complex, or unfavorable. And that's where you talk about, everyone talks about the third-party neutral host model taking significant time. We have actually seen a carrier come to us and say, we want to be in that building. So we go to that building owner, and, and we say, look, we've got a carrier here, and we're ready to go. Let's negotiate an agreement. And then the negotiations go 12 months. And the budget cycle passes, and the money goes away. Just because they've identified a location that they want to go on does not mean that they're not looking for alternative solutions. They're going down multiple paths to solve network problems, because that's how the engineers get bonused. They get bonused on meeting that capital spend, so they get mad if they commit capital and it doesn't get spent. And they get bonused on drop calls, throughput. So they are going to do everything possible to make sure that those statistical performance metrics are met. Some of the lease red flags are there. One-sided terms. Property owner termination rights, 
They, they will not go on a they will not go on a building that has some of these terms at all. When you work with American Tower, what are the owner roles and responsibilities in our programs, our managed network program? So if you have a larger portfolio, sometimes we negotiate agreements with larger portfolios. Jeff and I negotiated Boston Properties together uh, that closed uh, last year. They have offices in San Francisco, D.C., uh, and Boston, obviously, Boston Properties. But when you go negotiate at a, at a national level of a company of that size or read of that size, sometimes the desire and the need does not filter down to the lower markets. And the building owner managers are, hey, this is my building. You're not, I don't care what you sign. This is my building. You're not coming in my building. So introducing the ATC program to your property owners and the managers of those property owners is, is what we expect from our owners. And we expect... Um, if you want to generate revenue, that you provide the critical uh, data set to ATC. And that data set includes where is the space? Do we have the space, the equipment room? Um, we look at floor plans. We look at heights. What type of uh, CLEX are coming into the building to provide backhaul? And, 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 and at an ownership level, we look for you to champion the approvals. Um, the carriers want to move fast. We don't want to move slow. Everyone has said that the, that the third-party neutral host model is small or is slow. I don't want to move slow. We, we all don't get paid rent a rent check um, until the deal is done. So it's our goal to move fast, and it's up to us to remove the barriers to move fast. Our responsibilities, again, are... We are a wireless infra infrastructure solutions leader, and we're, we have ability to translate the latest wireless technologies and revenue generating opportunities. Our program, we create marketing materials. We have a site database that you can go online at any time. You all could do that today, too. Uh, you could register to American Tower anytime we add an asset. You can get emailed um, to, your, to, to, uh, to you directly. Um, we do all the necessary construction, RF engineering, fiber engineering. We monitor deployment and construction management. So, and, and, and we have an ongoing contract management with you to make sure that the carriers are staying within their lease space and that they're acting properly on your building and they're not doing things out of the scope such as adding antennas. A lot of revenue that is generated from your rooftop is not actually done on the initial contract. A lot of it is done through amendments. I think we do probably more amendment work. A lot of those 22,000 transactions that we completed last year um, were actually amendment work. And so what that means is you get your initial rent check when, when it starts with a 3% escalator every year and you get the, a percentage of that, you get a majority of that percentage because you built the infrastructure itself. On a tower, it reverses. On a DAS, that, that, that business model flips because I am having to put in capital. If we don't have to put in capital, you get most of the money because you built the building. But what happens when that carrier comes and wants to add LTE? What happens when that carrier wants to come and change antennas? What happens when they want to add more antennas and more equipment? Well, if they're taking more space, then the carriers pay more money. And that amendment fee comes in, and you get, again, get your proportional share, your proportional majority share of that incremental revenue that grows over time. So some of the other things that I wrote down that I thought I'd talk about, and then, I, and then I'll open it up to questions to everybody, is that it is important to remember that this type of infrastructure is becoming the brick and mortar of the economy. It's no longer the Sears building or the Walmart where a lot of these transactions are happening. It's happening over wireless infrastructure and sales. And that you really need to, all those transactions that are happening in your building by your tenants, it is important to have in-building coverage as a service. And I, I would not call it an amenity either. It, it is a service itself. Um, you really need to, and this is difficult in New York City, it's one of the hardest 
obviously the, the, the hardest market to negotiate with attorneys and building owners because the main business is driving revenue off square footage and I'm coming to you and asking you for square footage that you could rent possibly and I'm telling you I, I'm not even going to give you close to market rent of what it would take, especially for an in-building system. On the rooftop in those spaces, you know, you're not, uh, you don't care about that space. Again, that's, that's found money, as Jeff said. But in-building, I'm going to need space. And I might need space that's rentable because now you want everything on the third floor. It's not in the basement because you don't want it to get flooded. But it's, so it's important for you to plan whoever you use. You need to plan your building appropriately for wireless infrastructure if you want it there on the roof to generate revenue or if you want a DAS system inside your building. You need to allocate at least, at a minimum, 200 square feet for wireless services for, for a small cells. DAS, DAS head-ins are shrinking in size because as we talked about earlier that, that we're going to this cloud-based, but you're gonna need one rack probably per carrier at a minimum. Even, even in the cloud environment, maybe, maybe a little less than that. A lot of times you just can't get them to even to share the same rack. You know, you, you'll, they'll have a huge 19 inch rack, seven foot rack, and there'll be two switches because they don't want to work together. So it's important for you to plan accordingly. When you are doing building upgrades um, and with CRAN, if you're, if you're making a, a, an, an investment in your building, it's important to engage with consultants, whoever you choose, if that's American Tower or uh, other folks that are here today, that you integrate in your plans. A lot of the budget money that you're looking at for security cameras, a lot of the budget money that you're looking at for in-building uh, automation, a lot of that money for public safety that you're looking at, if planned properly, and you take into consideration the wireless network, you can, you, you can get carriers attached to your building by using that infrastructure. A as an example, we talked about the West Coast. The, uh, I've got a couple minutes left. I should probably open to questions. My last example is um, one of our major REIT vendors uh, did an expansion on their mall that triggered a certificate of occupancy that needed to be reissued. Well, on a certificate of occupancy, that means the fire department comes out. They did not have coverage. So there's... They're paying a thousand dollars a day, fine, and they have to pay to have a fireman at the building every day. So it got to the point where they said, "Well, we're, we're going to invest in that." So we're working with them. We're we're helping them finance their public safety, and while we're designing that public safety system for them, we're designing. A DAS. Uh, that's all I have. Any questions on anything? Anyone? Sure. When you're lighting up a building, um, you have infrastructure costs as you're discussing. You have space requirements, electrical requirements, all things that um, have fiscal impact upon the uh, building owner. Um, at some point, there has to be a cutoff. I mean, unless you have a, a Blackstone or trading firm in the, you know, in the, uh, the, the proper client that's doing high-frequency trading, that could cost justify it. There has to be a cutoff point where the building might not generate adequate revenue in terms of broadband sales mm -hmm. to cost justify the overhead of professional services that you're bringing in in tandem with the carriers that could be delivering through uh, a multi-pop uh, mm -hmm. traditional um, delivery underground method. Um, How do you address that? So okay. if I'm bringing in the cost, I, 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 we're, we're a bank. We're a telecom bank, right? That's, so whenever I invest a dollar, I've got to get a return on it. It usually takes, on an in-building system, it usually takes a 10-year amount of time to get the return that I want. With a single carrier, I can probably get my weighted average cost of capital back within the 10 year period, I start making money on two carriers and then three carriers, the thing starts getting frothy and there's, there's money to share. But again, as we talked about, AT&T and Verizon are the ones that are there that, that, are, that are, there's usually two. Our average is 2.1 or 2.2 or 2.3, sorry. Thanks, Eric. And, but after, so if you are gonna negotiate, hey, I want some money now, I understand that you need to get in and make your money and get a return. I, I, 
and and get that money back is that that's when you start looking to recoup or start maybe even start doing a heavier rev share at after 10 after that first 10 year term so if you have those costs inside the building that um that you're saying you're, you're looking at the space that you've taken and say i can make more money by taking you out and i don't need you anymore um you can start generating revenue and I can start giving you more money after that, after I've get, have received my money back. On a rooftop, I mean, you're gonna continue to get that revenue share in perpetuity as long as the agreement's there. Does that, does that answer your question? Sure. Yes. Yeah. So we use our existing tower compounds um, to connect to um, other wireless networks. We 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 do currently do that the uh, the the, the C RAN type of environment, although it's going to be going up in scale, um, where you have a hotel. We do that in Vegas. So we 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 operate distributed antenna systems in Las Vegas. Probably mo a, a lot of the properties in Vegas and in Caesar's Palace. We have one head end. Where we in one equipment location where we serve multiple buildings, um, and the carriers are going to start serving their hotels from our towers. They're going to take all their base stations from the base of our towers. Um, doesn't change any type of re rent that we're receiving from them, but it gives them operational economies of scale um, where they bring that back to the hotel and do that. But yes, you can. So, so if you're asking, sometimes if let's say a building owner gives me a lot of space. If a, if, a building, if a building owner gives me, hey, I've got 2,000 square feet that I'm not using right now, if you can use that to connect other buildings, will you pay me more money? The answer is yes. And you just uh, address that on an, in an, an amendment to the agreement as we come in to add more equipment. So we'll, we would light up your building first if that was part of the project or light up your rooftop. And if you're doing a DAS, don't forget to run fiber to the roof because there is revenue opportunity having fiber up there. Um, but yes, then you, um, then we would come back to you and say, hey, we're going to use you and your extra space as a hotel to serve that other building. <laughs>